Hello everyone and welcome to the next session in our Get Data Protection Fit series 2022. This session is all about how to assess whether to notify a data breach. My name is Natalie Barnfield, I'm a director in the Field Fisher London Data Team and I'm joined today by Kirsten Whitfield, also a director in the London Data Team and just so happens to be one of our data breach experts and our trainee solicitor Imogen Boffin. Before we get started, we do want to thank you for joining us for this, our third year of the Get Data Protection Fit series. And just to remind you that you can access all of the prior series and other awesome webinars on the Field Fisher Data Team YouTube channel. Today is the first instalment of a mini series that we're actually running on data breaches. This part one uh, focuses on how, how to assess whether to notify a data breach and part two tells you how to practically make your notification to the ICO and part three tells you about how to complete your data breach register. You can see that there's other um, interesting topics that we're covering during the 2022 series and you can find those again on our YouTube channel. So by the end of this session our aim is that you should be able to First, identify the key steps necessary to prepare for a data breach. So we're going to touch on this just in brief, essentially to set the scene um, for your breach assessment. Second, understand the thresholds for reporting a personal data breach, whether that be to um, regulators or to individuals. Thirdly, understand the relevant factors to consider when assessing risk. Fourth, apply a robust methodology to assess risk consistently and ultimately five undertake a data breach risk assessment thank you natalie there are a whole range of technical and organizational measures that businesses ought to take not only to prevent a personal data breach from occurring but also to respond to a personal data breach we don't have time to cover these all in full or in detail today. This is intended as a recap of the key steps to ensure you have in place before you suffer an incident. Number one, identify your incident response team. Firstly, you should seek to identify a team and deputies responsible for leading the response efforts. Depending on your organization, teams are usually made up of representatives from information security teams, legal, compliance, potentially PR, and senior management. These individuals should be aware of their obligations in the event of a data breach and the internal procedures that need to be followed. Number two, identify architecture of systems, technologies, and data. This might seem obvious, but having a clear understanding of the data you process and the systems in which they are housed is key in the event of a personal data breach. This exercise involves more than just data mapping. It is critical to identify where different instances of the same data are stored on systems and databases, that te the technologies used to store them, and which legal entities are responsible for those systems and data. Number three, incident response plans and processes. It's very important to have an incident response policy or plan which clearly sets out the steps that need to be taken by the incident response team. Within this should be clear guidance on how to undertake your risk assessment. Phil Fisher can of course help you with an incident response policy. Number four, mock incident response workshops. Members of your incident response team should ideally undergo some form of training, including response workshops that take them through a mock incident. Number five, it's also sensible to identify a spokesperson for communications with the media, regulators, government bodies, data subjects, employees, and others. Some clients also find it helpful to prepare draft media responses, which would obviously need adapting depending on the different facts of an incident. Number six, it is also important that you carefully check your insurance cover and ensure that it covers the likes of a personal data breach. It's also important that you're aware of any exclusions or conditions that, if not complied with, could invalidate the insurance. For example, insurers may have specified security measures you must have implemented to ensure your insurance is not invalidated. And finally, 
It's also helpful to identify your breach partners and even ensure that you've negotiated engagement terms and signed contracts with them prior to suffering a personal data breach. This means that you can spring into action with your partners immediately after discovering your breach. This could include IT forensic experts, legal advisors, IS consultants and credit monitoring vendors. We also wanted to recap on the key steps that generally arise in the life cycle of any data breach incident. Obviously, assessing risk is one of those key steps. However, as anyone who has suffered a data breach will know, there is no one clear sequence or order that these steps should or do take. Typically, responding to a data breach involves juggling a number of different steps at one time in order to meet your regulatory obligations to assess and, if necessary, report your breach to your regulator. A key takeaway is that, while it's important to assess risk as early as possible, you also need information about the nature of the breach to enable you to do so. And the more that you know about the nature of the breach and any aggravating or mitigating factors, the better position you will be in to conduct a robust assessment. So be before we think about how to assess whether to notify a data breach, we first need to understand what the GDPR and UK GDPR says about personal data breaches and notification obligations generally. And that's what I'm going to cover in this and the next slide. So firstly, the concept of a personal data breach. Now, the GDPR defines a personal data breach as any breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorised disclosure of or access to personal data that's transmitted, stored or otherwise processed. So in essence, any security incident that affects the confidentiality, integrity or availability of personal data is likely to constitute a personal data breach. It's quite a broad definition. Now, broadly speaking, if you do suffer a personal data breach, there are really three sort of outcomes, if you like. If the facts of your breach allow you to conclude that there is no risk to data subjects, you just need to document the facts that led to that conclusion from an accountability perspective and also register the breach on your internal breach register. And that's an obligation under the GDPR, as is accountability more broadly. If, however, the facts of your breach do not enable you to conclude that a risk to data subjects is unlikely, i.e. you have identified that there's some risk, you have an obligation to notify that personal data breach to your data protection authority without undue, undue delay and where feasible within 72 hours. And finally, if the facts of your breach are likely to result in a high risk to, to the rights and freedoms of individuals or data subjects, you are also expected to notify not only the Data Protection Authority, but also the affected individuals, and that is within um, without undue delay. So we know that there's generally an obligation to notify the Data Protection Authority unless the breach is unlikely to result in a risk to individuals and that there's also an obligation to notify the affected individuals if the breach is likely to result in a high risk to them. But that does then beg the obvious question of what do we mean by risk? What are these potential risks to individuals that we are looking to assess? It's first important to note that maybe unhelpfully, um, the GDPR doesn't actually provide a helpful sort of off the shelf definition of risk or high risk. So there's no you know, help, helpful checklist of factors that might indicate whether you've thought you fall into one bucket or another or when you've met the threshold for notifying. It's ultimately a case of assessing the relevant factors to determine whether you think you've met, met the threshold. And for that reason, this is, it's, this is why um, it's very helpful to have a clear methodology, methodology to help you to do so. And that's what we're going to cover in some of the upcoming slides. 
but you can get a better understanding of what's meant by risk, both from the EDPB guidelines on personal data breaches and also within the recitals to the GDPR and the UK GDPR itself. So just to have a quick look at some of the recitals and what they say. So if you have a look at recital 75, it makes clear that the risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals um, can result from processing which could lead to physical, material or non-material damage. It then goes on to give some examples of those that type of damage. So um, it lists discrimination, identity theft or fraud, financial loss, damage to reputation, the loss of confidentiality, um, of data that's protected by professional secrecy, and then goes on to give further examples of risks that might um, present if you were talking about certain categories of data, for example, um, high volumes of special category data or data that's otherwise considered sensitive, data about uh, vulnerable data subjects such as children. And recital 76 talks about looking at the likelihood and severity of the risk and in doing so considering the nature, scope, context and purposes of processing. So when you look at this in the round, you have to think about the possible consequences um, of your breach, both in material, physical and non-material um, terms. And you also have to think about the likelihood and severity of those risks based on a number of factors, not solely about the nature of personal data, but also the volume. Uh, the con context of the breach, for example, whether or not um, it involved a mal actor or whether or not it was simply an accident, uh, whether or not there, there were any mitigating factors that maybe reduces the likelihood of risk. So these are sort of the building blocks, if you like, um, for understanding how to go about assessing risk that will help us to inform the methodology that, that we use. So just before I pass over to Kirsten um, to take us through the methodology for assessing risk or some of the methodologies to consider when assessing risk, we thought it might be helpful to just um, explain what resources are available to help inform your assessment methodology. Now, some of these um, resources we've already touched on in earlier parts of the session um, and they will, I'm sure, be familiar to you. Um, but just by way of recap, they are um, the Article 29 Working Party Guidelines on Personal Data, data Breach Notification. Um, so these guidelines are relatively detailed. They cover all aspects of personal data breach notifications um, and they do helpfully build on or expand on some of those concepts of risk. Um, that I've explained in the earlier slide uh, from the recitals. They also explain how you might approach um, assessing those risks. We also have the ANISA guidelines. Now, these are guidelines that are actually referenced within the Article 29 Working Party guidelines I've, I've mentioned above. Um, ANISA stands for the EU Agency for Network and Information Security. And these actually... Um, provide quite a specific and robust methodology for assessing risk within the context of a personal data breach. Um, they're a very formulaic methodology and that's something that Kirsten's going to explain in a little bit more detail in the upcoming slides. We also have some relatively new EDPB guidelines on examples regarding data breach notifications. So these guidelines were published only earlier this year in January this year. Um, and essentially, they set out hypothetical data breach scenarios, um, explaining you know, facts and circumstances surrounding hypothetical scenarios um, and explain whether or not the controller in that scenario made the right decision to notify or not and to notify to, to data subjects or not as well. 
We also have some ICO, some UK specific guidelines, which aren't quite as detailed as the EDPB guidelines, um, but do sort of mirror them um, in, in, for the most part. And similarly, the ICO has also produced their own examples of data breach um, scenarios that you can use for comparison to yours. Thanks, Natalie. So as Natalie just mentioned, there's a number of useful resources which can be used as a guide for assessing whether you need to notify a personal data breach under the GDPR or, or the UK GDPR. Um, we at Field Fisher have developed a methodology which is based primarily on the European Data Protection Board guidance and the ANISA guidance. So the ANISA guidance is useful because it tries to put a methodology around the assessment and that's really helpful for consistency when you're assessing incidents. But it does take quite a formulaic approach. Um, so there's various factors are, are used to calculate a, an actual numeric score. Then depending on your score, you get to an answer as to whether your breach is notifiable. So in practice, it can be more of a judgment call. So it can be better to review incidents um, and give them a risk rating based on a more simplistic um, approach of is it low to no risk, is it medium risk, or is it high risk? Um, but the ANISA style calculations can be used as a way of sense checking and backing up the decision making, and the methodology is still very useful in making your decisions. So the ANISA approach, they, they consider the data processing context. For example, what type of data is involved? What are the contextual factors surrounding it? Like, is it high volume? Is it sensitive information? Vulnerable individuals? Is it particularly useful for committing fraud or ID theft? Um, and then you also consider the ease of identifying the individual in the, and the type of the breach. For example, was it accidental email sent? Was it a malicious actor involved? And in our field Fisher methodology, we go further than that still, and we also take into account the mitigations. So let's take that example of an accidental email send. Has it been sent to a recipient who's now subsequently confirmed they've deleted the information, and you, it's a trusted recipient, so you, you trust that they have actually deleted the information? And have you therefore, therefore mitigated the risk and the harm to the individuals involved? Now, the way that the ANISA guidance sets out its ratings is actually quite robust. So there is an element of um, risk approach. So their first rating, for example, is that there is a low rating. They don't start with completely no um, risk to data subjects. Um, but the way that they've divided up their ratings is really quite useful. Um, so if you're prepared to take a bit of a risk-based approach and, and rely on the severity ratings from ANISA, um, it is useful um, to use the low, medium, high, and very high ratings to give you an idea as to whether it's notifiable incident or not, and the descriptions that ANISA give that go along with it. So the low, for example, um, the individuals will encounter a few inconveniences which they will overcome without any problem. So it's um, it's really annoyance and irritation. The very high rating um, is completely at the opposite end of the spectrum and you've got some really severe consequences for data subjects. Now I thought it would be helpful to put our field Fisher methodology for calculating whether you need to notify into context by using one of the European Data Protection Board guidelines examples. So this is this is the set of examples Natalie mentioned earlier. And I chose case number four because the, the ransomware attack is an increasingly common incident that um, organizations are facing. And in the context of this particular one, uh, the background facts are that there's been an attack and data has been encrypted, including the backups. And client and employee data has been taken from the system, as well as several thousand customers' data. And the data includes basic identifiers, and in relation to the customers or service users, as they're called, um, identity, identity cards and financial data, such as your credit card details as well. 
So here on this slide, you see a table, and this is how we at Field Fisher would document the risk assessment. And you populate the table with all of the relevant facts, um, and you document your decision around the notifiability. Now, having it documented in this way is really helpful for accountability purposes and to show that you are being consistent and considered around your decisions. So even if that decision is one that you don't need to notify, it's good to document it just in case a dead protection regulator knocks on your door later on down the line. You want to show them that you have a reasoned and thought through methodology for making decisions. So um, the risk to data subjects is going to vary in this case depending on who they are and what data has been taken. So I would always recommend um, breaking down the, your assessment by data subject type. So here we have the employees and the clients on this slide, and then the next one you'll see we, we've dealt with service users. Taking the employee example first, so it's, it's name and uh, business contact details that have been taken, so it's fairly low risk, albeit it might be high volume. Um, so there could be some risk of, for example, phishing attacks, but, but it doesn't create a great deal of risk for data subjects um, in the business sense. It might even be information that is available online on LinkedIn, or it could be on the business's website. So the identifiability rating in this case is high because we have their contact details. We know who it relates to. And the circumstances of the breach is a high rating because there's malicious intent behind it. But when you combine that with the severity rating and, and in terms of consequences for the individuals, it's, it's, it's no risk or low risk. So as a result, we would classify this as not notifiable to data subjects or to the data protection regulator. But from a practical perspective, um, you may want to consider telling staff about the incident anyway, because forewarned is forearmed, and then they can be extra vigilant around potential phishing attacks. I'm going to quickly skip over the client contacts example, because that will be very similar to the employee one, and move on to service users. So with service users, we're looking at a very different picture. The name of the service user has been taken, identity cards and credit card information. And it's high volume, and it was taken with malicious intent. And um, so individuals are very much identifiable. The severity rating would be high. And because of the high risk to these service users, the incident would be notifiable to the data subjects and to the um, data protection regulator as well. Um, and as you'll see in this example here, there aren't any mitigations that have, um, are going to prevent or, or that harm or make it unlikely. Now, just to put this a bit more into context, this is quite a simplistic example uh, with not a huge amount of facts. And often in real life, um, there will be lots and lots of different facts that are coming in all the time, um, there will also be lots of unknowns. So quite often, these um, assessments and documentation of them, it becomes uh, quite a bit more detailed. Um, and the other thing to bear in mind is that um, the approach that we're taking here is it's a high level, sort of across the board for GDPR and UK GDPR type approach um, using guidances that are available. Um, but you might also get local guidance. You might have local enforcement, um, which could flavor your assessment um, locally. So as we draw to the end of this session on how to assess whether to notify a data breach, we hope that you can now identify the key steps that you should be taking to prepare for a data breach before it occurs. Understand the thresholds for reporting personal data breaches, both to regulators and also to individuals. Understand the relevant factors that you need to consider when assessing risk. To apply a robust methodology to assess risk consistently and ultimately to undertake a data breach risk assessment. 
If you are interested in learning more about data protection and privacy law, then please visit our YouTube channel, which hosts a variety of content to bring you up to speed on some of the basics of the latest updates in the GDPR world. To join the channel, please use this link in the slide below. You can also join our team's email digest and receive periodic updates about the subjects that matter to you daily, weekly or monthly. Please see the link on the slide as well. So, all that remains to say is thank you very much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed it and don't hesitate to get in contact if you have any comments or questions. We look forward to seeing you again next time for the second instalment on data breaches, which will look at how to make a notification to the ICO. Thank you. Goodbye.